This is me, sitting in a tree and trying to take a picture of the sunset through branches. What's the sound? Huh, branch cracking. Perfect! Yeah, as you could have guessed, I'm really into photography. I'm Tessa, by the way, but whatever. I was falling down, preparing for the worst, and then, poof! When I opened my eyes, someone was holding me in their hands. They caught me, and this someone was Gabriel, the cutest guy in school. This was like a dream come true. But, well, unfortunately, Gabriel also had the worst personality in school. Balance, I guess. Watch where you're falling, monkey brains. Monkey brains? What kind of an insult is this? Are you a first grader? Annoyed, Gabriel let me go, and I fell right on my butt. I was fine, but my very expensive lens was not. I was furious, ready to shout more mature insults at my savior. But he was already going away like nothing happened. And here's the thing about me. I'm like a shark. When I latch onto something, I don't let go. I'm not sure that's how sharks work, but it sounds cool. So I wanted to show Gabriel that you simply don't talk to people like that. So I decided to follow Gabriel. You see, this guy had some secrets, some skeletons in his closet. In school, he never talked to anyone, although girls were all over him. He also always looked tired and had new band-aids every day. There were some nasty rumors about him doing something illegal, maybe being in the mafia or some kind of vampire because he was so pale and mysterious. Stupid, handsome Gabriel, always giving everyone this oh-so-intense look. But come to think of it, I once caught him when nobody was around, and it looked like he was very sad. I replaced the lens and went after him. But not only out of spite, I was also curious. Gabriel went into the docks, and I will admit, I was getting a bit spooked because, well, it was almost nighttime by that point, and following a creepy vampire guy at night didn't seem like a good idea. But sometimes, pride is more important than common sense. Gabriel was unloading some kind of boat with other men, all of them looking very grim and serious. What was he doing? Was it something illegal? I was determined to collect evidence, so I hid further away and took a photo of him. And, of course, for some reason, the flash was on. Maybe something happened when the camera had fallen, but Gabriel looked straight at me. He had this scary look in his eyes, like a black panther staring at a rabbit. The next thing that happened was him running towards me with a furious look in his eyes. I shrieked and ran away and almost fell into water. But Gabriel caught me and didn't let me fall. He was holding my hand, both of us breathing heavily. Oh, saved by him again. When he realized he was still holding my hand, he hastily let me go. You again? Are you following me? No, I mean, yes. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? You're so handsome, the docks are not a place for you. I spat it all out without thinking, got embarrassed, and put a hand against my mouth. Gabriel suddenly blushed. Well, at least now I knew he wasn't a vampire. I work here, legally, monkey br- <sighs> Our grandma can't really take care of us, so I have to work so me and my sister would- <sighs> Never mind. Just mind your own business, all right? He turned his back to me and started to leave. I felt very guilty. I was so deep in my thoughts I forgot that I was near the water, so I began stumbling again. Gabriel noticed it and rushed to help me, dragging me back, saving me the third time in a row, and then he lost his balance and fell into the cold water. Thankfully, he knew how to swim, so everything was all right. But the next day, he was not in school. So I asked our teachers, and they said he called in sick. I went to his house, brought him flowers and chocolates. I knocked on the door. He opened, looking very sick and annoyed. Hey, I'm so sorry for... Bam! He closed the door right in front of me. Rude! But I guess I deserved it. Then a little girl approached me with a ball. This must have been a sister. Hi there, I'm Sophia. You must be that horrible girl. What? No. He called me horrible? Yes. He said he can't work now because you made him sick. The next moment, Gabriel opened the door. Sophia, go inside. Don't talk to the witch. The witch? How dare he? But I guess... <sighs> I deserve that. So I kept coming to his house, trying to help in some way. Once, I pushed money underneath the door. Next thing I saw was Gabriel throwing this money out the window. It was so stupid. His pride was more important for him than common sense. Well, after several attempts, I knocked firmly on the door. He opened, still looking sick, and immediately started closing it again, but I stopped him. Listen here, I know you hate me, but you can't work now. So you need money, and Sophia needs some company. I don't need... You don't, but she does. Stop being irresponsible. To my surprise, Gabriel blushed and nodded. It was kinda cute. I spent the entire following day with Sophia. This girl was sweet and too energetic. I had to chase her all around the park. And finally, I lured her with ice cream. When we were eating it, she pushed my face into it. Hey, 
That's what Gabriel always does to me. After this, she told me everything about Gabriel. How sweet and caring he was to her. Was she talking about the same moody, gloomy Mr. Don't Talk to Me Gabriel? Well, it started to make sense to me. After their parents had died, their grandmother tried very hard, but it wasn't enough. So Gabriel had to find a job as soon as he turned 18, studying during the day and working at night. He was sad and tired the whole time, but never showed it to his little sister. <sighs> Stupid, handsome, kind Gabriel. Oh no, I liked him. With time, Gabriel recovered from his sickness and started to spend more time with Sophia. I went to hang out with them and saw this version of Gabriel with my own eyes for the first time. I bought some ice cream for him, and when he started eating it, I pushed his face into it. He got very mad, but then realized that I was avenging his little sister and burst out laughing. But the next moment, he got very serious. I think you should go. What? Why? I'm not sick anymore. You don't have to feel guilty any longer or something. When he said that, he took Sophia by the hand, and they left. She turned her head and waved goodbye at me. My heart sank. Honestly, I cried when I went home that day. It was all my fault. It was silly of me to think that he would actually like me back. A few weeks passed and I got a message from Sophia. The message said, He likes you, but he's not very smart. I smiled. That evening, I went to his house and threw a rock at the window. It was supposed to draw his attention, but of course, it broke the window. Gabriel ran out furious. What the hell? I didn't hang out with you because I felt guilty. I'm sorry, but stop being mean to me. Gabriel froze. He looked me right in the eye. I'm sorry. Silence. We looked into each other's eyes, and then he hugged me and kissed me. I melted. After a kiss, he looked me in the eye again. I didn't know what to say. He started to speak, and my heart was beating hard with anticipation. You will have to pay for the window, though. Hello, world. I'm Anna. It was my first day of middle school when the teacher asked me to say a few words about myself in front of the class. But the local mean girl began to roast me because of my accent right away. Is that even English? What planet are you from, girl? You see, my parents and I had just immigrated to the USA from Moldova. I was super shy and my English was far from perfect. Only one person stood up for me. Leave her alone, Betty. Your French is much worse. And this is how I met my future bestie, Erica. We stayed friends throughout middle and high school, and we were both fond of painting. But my parents didn't take my talent seriously. So I had to borrow art supplies from Erica or just use materials I had on hand. My parents insisted that I go to law school. So I took a gap year. And our initial plan was that I would work as an assistant at a law firm and prepare for college. Next stop, getting a master's degree and a fancy job with a six-digit salary. And eventually, dying from boredom, I guess. But instead of the law firm, I got a job as a babysitter. And I spent all my money on art classes that I attended in secret. Together with Erica, of course. We had a wonderful teacher who helped many students apply to the art school of my dreams. I planned to tell my parents something like, Hey guys, the law school didn't accept me, blah blah blah, that's too bad. But this art school wants to give me a grant. But so far, they didn't have a clue. That's why I had to hide all my paintings in Erica's garage. One day, I arrived at the art studio as usual and noticed a new face. It was Leo, the golden boy from my school. My heart skipped a beat. I had a crush on him when I was little, but he was too cool to notice me. What are you doing here? I'm only here because my parents told me I had to be. Well, obviously, because he didn't make any effort. Although, he had some natural talent. Hmm. But anyway, that day, our teacher amazed us with another surprise. One of the fanciest galleries in the city had announced a contest. Winners were to get an exhibition space and monetary prizes. Anna, you should definitely send in your work. Can I apply too? Well, yeah, anyone can try. We followed his advice and applied. But I didn't hope for anything. It had been a couple of weeks. I kept on babysitting and saving money. And then one day, the boy I was looking after broke his parents' piano and blamed it on me. They threatened to call the police if I didn't pay for the broken piano. Of course I paid, because I didn't want to involve my parents. So I ended up with no job and no savings. It was very sad because I couldn't afford the art studio anymore. I went there before class to say goodbye and pick up my instruments. 
The class was empty, and I couldn't help it and burst into tears. And suddenly, I heard his voice. Anna, why are you crying? What happened? I have to leave because I'm too poor to pay for these classes. Hmm. What if I told you I needed a private tutor? He handed me a napkin. What? Our rich bully had a heart? Yeah, right. Don't tell me you want to be an artist. Nope, I just want my trust fund back. Oh, I see. You see, Leo had made some questionable choices in the past, so now he needed to win back his parents' trust to regain access to the family money. So it was a win-win deal for us. We shook hands and began to meet for private lessons at the studio three times a week. And honestly, it felt like babysitting because Leo pulled silly pranks all the time. But I didn't complain. At the end of the day, he paid much more than my previous employer. And he was still my crush, but that was my big secret. After a while, I received an email from the art contest. I made it to the finals. And I was getting a prize of $20,000, plus money from the sale of my work. That's what I call main character vibes. I was over the moon and called Erica right away. But unfortunately, she didn't win anything. So that day was kind of bittersweet for us. Meanwhile, my classes with Leo carried on. One day, Leo offered to draw my portrait. And gosh, we had such intense eye contact. It's ready. Can I see it? But there was no portrait. He just wrote pure beauty. It was so cute and romantic. I don't know what came over me, but I kissed him. He hugged me tight and stroked my hair very gently. I've always dreamed of hooking up with a teacher. <laughs> Shut up. Sorry, I'm super nervous because I really like you. Leo walked me home that night and we agreed to go on a real date the next week. But first, I had to deal with exhibition planning. The next morning, I went to pick up my work from Erica's garage. I had to deliver them to the gallery, but they were gone. What the heck, Erica? Erica gaslighted me like a psycho. She claimed she didn't remember me leaving any paintings in her garage. I was shocked. Bruh, I don't have time for pranks. I need my paintings. Sorry, can't help ya. I think you should leave. You need to see a doctor, Erica. I decided to go home and think because I literally didn't know what to do. But when I got there, I faced another unpleasant surprise. Erica called my parents and spilled the tea on me. They knew everything about my secret life. Dad showed me a picture of me kissing Leo, caught in 4K. Seems like Erica had been spying on us that night. I'm so sorry I lied to you guys. You are so grounded. Go to your room. My first art exhibition was taking place in just two days, but my zero empathy parents refused to listen. Not only did they ground me, but they also took away my phone and my Wi-Fi. I spent the rest of the night in my room like a prisoner. Thankfully, Leo began to worry and came to my house, but my parents drove him away. He snuck around the house and knocked on my window. I explained the situation briefly and he asked me to run away with him. I quickly packed my bag and climbed out the window. Leo brought me to his mansion. He let me stay in the guest house for as long as I needed. Thank you so much, Leo. I have no idea what to do with Erica. No worries. I've got an idea. The next day, Leo and I went to Erica and offered her money for my paintings. Come on, Erica. Name your price. Hmm. Let me think. She wrote the sum on a piece of paper. $200,000. Can you believe that? Okay. But first... I want to see what I'm buying. Erica took us to the basement. I saw my paintings just sitting there. Thank goodness you didn't do anything to them. Suddenly, three masked men broke into the basement, grabbed the paintings, and ran away. Of course, Erica didn't expect that. She looked shook. Oops, looks like everyone wants Anna's art. I guess the deal is off. Goodbye, Erica. The robbers were fake. We asked the bodyguards of Leo's father to dress up and help us. And these guys really understood the assignment. Leo helped me bring the paintings to the gallery just in time. I continued to live with him, and it felt amazing, to be honest. I had enough time and freedom to prepare and send my application to the art school. Leo decided to follow in my footsteps and apply to the art history track. We decided to buy a new phone for me, and I texted my parents and invited them to my exhibition. And surprisingly, they showed up. What a twist! Mom, Dad... 
I'm sorry that I left, but I'm the only person who has to live my life day by day. So let me decide for myself, please. We know, honey, and we're sorry too. My folks liked my paintings when they saw that other people appreciated them. One art dealer offered ten thousand dollars for one of my works. When my dad heard that, he choked. Gosh, can I become an artist too? From that day on, my relationship with my parents became more mature. As for Erica, ugh, she really freaks me out. So I'm just trying to stay <laughs> away from her. Hi, I'm Sherlock Holmes. Nah, <laughs> just kidding. My name's Veronica. My dad is the chief of police. No wonder I've always dreamed of fighting the bad guys just like him. However, he was too stubborn. No, Veronica, it's too dangerous. You need to find a safe job. Blah blah blah. But like father, like daughter, I was even more stubborn. He threw out my detective novels. I wrote them myself. He threw away my spy toys. I made new ones out of trash. As a final act of rebellion, I applied for the criminal law program in college. Dad was furious, but after some arguing, he just gave up and let me be. College wasn't easy, of course, but I got really lucky because I met Ash. It's funny because at first I didn't like him at all. The teacher's pet from a rich family? Ugh, give me a break. But one day he helped me with a difficult project, and since then I've gotten to know him better. He turned out to be a really nice guy and also dreamed of making the world a better place. We started hanging out a lot, and over time. We became a couple. Everything in my life was going perfect until one day, when something strange happened. I was walking through the mall and heard a familiar voice. I turned around and saw Ash. It was unexpected, so I happily ran up to him. Ash, hi. What are you doing here? I thought you didn't like this mall, but he just looked at me, confused. Um, I'm sorry. Do I know you? W what? I laughed because I thought he was joking at first, but he seemed very serious. All right, Ash. Very funny, but seriously, what? You must have me mistaken for someone else. I need to go. Hey, what are you? Ugh, shut up! I looked at the screen of my phone that was ringing and froze. Ash? But he's right in front of me. I picked up the phone and actually heard Ash's voice. What's going on? The other Ash was about to leave, but I quickly blocked his way. Hold on a second, Ash. Can you please turn the camera on? Um. Okay. Ash turned on the camera, and all of us froze in shock. My boyfriend and his identical copy were looking at each other. Is this some kind of stupid joke? No. Listen. Let's all calm down and talk about this. A little later, all three of us met at the cafe. Now looking at them. I could see that they're two different people. For example, Ash had a small scar on his forehead, while the copy did not. I guess I'm still years away from Sherlock Holmes. But anyway, we began to discuss the situation. The copy guy's name was Winter. He grew up as an only child in a poor family. Recently, he started working downtown so he could save some money for college. The whole situation seemed very strange. They weren't just a couple of doppelgangers; they were like twins. Hold on, Ash. You told me you were adopted, right? Huh? Well, yes, but you don't think. The three of us exchanged glances. Winter, could you ask your parents if you ever had a brother? At first, Winter got mad. He said that his parents were good people and they would never separate him from his own twin brother. But we had no other ideas, so in the end. He agreed to ask them about it. While we were waiting for a call from Winter, I decided to look for any possible information. I found out which orphanage Ash was from, so we tried to ask the staff there. They told us that it wasn't the parents who brought him here, but the police. One day, they found a homeless kid. After trying to find his parents, they had no other choice but to leave him here. Suddenly, Winter called us and asked us to come to his house right now. Turns out. He told his parents about what happened, and they confirmed it all. Ash and Winter really were twin brothers. We immediately drove to Winter's house. When we arrived, his parents met us at the doorstep. 
They looked at us in shock, as if they had just seen a ghost. And then Mrs. Moore threw herself into Ash's arms, sobbing. My boy, all these years, we're so glad you're okay. After a warm welcome, we went into the living room. Mr. and Mrs. Moore told us about what had happened. Thirteen years ago, they went camping in the woods. But then one of the twins, Ash, just disappeared. They searched everywhere and search parties wandered around for several days. But they never found anything. The search stopped after a week or so. That scar on your head. You must have fallen in the woods and lost your memory. You had to survive all alone. <sighs> My poor boy. She started crying again, and the family hugged tightly. What was playing out in front of me was incredibly touching. But I couldn't get rid of this weird feeling in my gut. So I asked them, if the police found Ash later, why didn't they bring him home? They probably figured that he was just a homeless child. I caught myself grinding my teeth. Are the police that careless? Did they really not notice that Ash was the same missing boy from the camping trip? But as I watched the happy family reunion, I decided to put my doubts aside. As time went on, the two families became closer. And even though Ash and Winter grew up in different places, they really had a lot in common. Ash's parents helped Winter get into college and even helped his family financially. All of this seemed like a fairy tale. And yet, I couldn't get rid of this unpleasant gut feeling. I tried to tell the boys about it, but they seemed kind of annoyed. They told me that I've been reading too many detective novels and that I've become paranoid. Maybe they were right? No. Something doesn't add up here. I know it. A true detective has to trust their gut. In the end, I decided to try and dig up the truth. I went to the police station. This place was like a second home to me. My dad used to leave me here when there was no babysitter to look after me. The plan was simple. I had to get into the archive room. Surely there must be something about Ash in there. While everyone was busy, I quietly went up to the second floor and... Ah, oh, dang it! Um, hi, Daddy. I just wanted to, um, see what's on the agenda. You aren't allowed in here, Veronica. Ugh, oh, seriously? Okay, Veronica, if you want to eventually be the law, now is the time to break it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Veronica! <sighs> have to be more careful. While dad was collecting papers, I quietly pulled the ID card out of his back pocket. And while profusely apologizing, I stealthed my way to the archive room. All right, I don't have much time. I need to find records from 13 years ago. Good thing they've all been digitized. Let's see. Missing. No, not that. Oh, here it is. I've got to print this file, and hurry before anyone notices me. Come on, come on. Yes, great. Whew. Fortunately, I managed to slip out of the archives and leave the police station as if nothing had happened. Dad will definitely find out, but that's okay. I've got to learn the truth, no matter the cost. At home, I was finally able to read the records. And to my great surprise, there was no information about Ash's disappearance anywhere. This is so strange. The police kept records of everything, but there was nothing about the incident in the forest. Unless, oh my lord. Of course, all of the pieces of the puzzle came together and my blood boiled with anger. I called Ash and asked him to pay a visit to Mr. and Mrs. Moore's house with me. Now I had a plan. We met at the appointed time. Everyone was surprised by my sudden call, but even more by my cold tone. Mr. and Mrs. Moore, you said that there was an active search after Ash's disappearance, but there's nothing about it in the police records. Um, th that's strange. They probably lost it or... Veronica, we asked you to stop your detective nonsense. I ignored that and kept pressing Mr. and Mrs. Moore with questions. I just needed to buy some time. But even now, these two were clearly becoming very nervous. Winter and Ash tried to calm me down, but I wasn't going to give up. The more questions I asked, the more confusing their answers became. I looked at my watch and grinned. Great. 
time for the final blow. The truth is that you yourself abandoned your child in the forest. Am I wrong? At that moment, we all heard sirens from police cars outside. Mr. Moore started panting heavily, and Mrs. Moore just blushed with anger. She ran towards me with a growl and grabbed me. Oh, you little! You can't prove anything, do you hear me? She swung at me, but at that moment, the police came into the house. They quickly handcuffed Mrs. Moore. We didn't have enough money for two children. Now we're finally rich and you ruin everything. Let me go, let me go! I explained the situation to the police. While they were dealing with it, I saw my dad. He looked very displeased. Veronica, what does this all mean? I tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't even listen. He kept interrupting and yelling at me, and I couldn't even talk because of the lump in my throat. But then, Veronica, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to apologize to you for not believing you. Yeah, you were right the whole time. Poor boy seemed much more upset than me. I hugged them and threw an evil look at my dad. He just sighed and said we'd talk later. Some time has passed and Mr. and Mrs. Moore were proving guilty. My father was angry at me at first, but then he relented and admitted that without me, they would have never caught these cruel people. He finally realized that I wouldn't give up my dream. And in that case, it's better if I conduct my investigations using more legal methods. Veronica, we're here. Fortunately, Winter and Ash were doing better. Ash's parents adopted Winter too. And now all three of us were finally happy. And that was the story of the first case I solved.